Good morning to you all. My name is Alexia Tassoli, and I hope uh, this morning we're going to have an interesting conversation uh, with two distinguished uh, political analysts. I uh, welcome Ms. Natalie Tocci, Director of the Instituto Affari Internazionale of Italy. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, Mr. Yanis Emanuelidis, Director of Studies of European Policy Center. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, let me start by asking both of you, uh, since Europe is, is, fa is facing its uh, greatest security crisis uh, for decades, uh, how was the war in, uh, against Ukraine changed the overall landscape and to which direction is shaping EU uh, external action? Ms. Tocci. Okay, so, I mean, as you, as you rightly, I think, point out, indeed, uh, the EU has been hopping from one crisis to the next, and, and every one, uh, you know, sort of seems to get worse and worse and worse. So, you know, actually, last night with, with Yanis, we were kind of remembering um, the 2005 constitutional treaty crisis, and hey, you know, that really seemed, you know, the end of the world in comparison to what we're living today, absolute peanuts. But I think if you take the sequence of crises, right? I mean, if you take the constitutional treaty crisis, the Eurozone crisis, the migration crisis, Brexit, and then pandemic and war, I think what's interesting is that whereas the first, uh, you know, the first crises, so basically, you know, from the constitutional treaty uh, through to the pandemic, um, the EU had really was in a real crisis to the extent that it was not using these crises mm -hmm. uh, to really make a step change forward. I mean, it was at best muddling through mm, uh, on the edge of the brink, perhaps never tipping over into the precipice, but never really, um, you know, using the proverbial crisis into an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think that with the pandemic and now with the war, um, this has changed. You know, I think that both with the pandemic and now with the war in Ukraine, essentially the EU has refound key words that really lie at the heart of, of the European project. Um, the little magic word of solidarity, now that was completely gone, uh, you know, with the Eurozone crisis, with the migration crisis, and it was definitely refound uh, with the pandemic. The word democracy. Um, which I think we have really rediscovered, you know, our values, we have really rediscovered thanks to Ukraine. So how this is going to kind of project the European Union in future, we see different avenues. Um, the idea of enlargement is living once again. It was dead in the water. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of moving forward in terms of asylum policy, uh, again, no progress, and now there is an opportunity. Um, energy uh, and moving really towards an energy union. We've been talking about it for a very long time. So you can trace, you know, different policy strands, but I think at the heart of it is refinding the political sense of the fact that we are a community of fate. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yes, I think Natalie is right. We have been, and we are living in an age of perma crisis. We're moving from one crisis to the other. It's also that these crises are interconnected with each other. And now people are saying of how, what the potential economic burden might be on Germany if energy sanctions are being imposed and making a comparison to what happened in the 2010 to 15 period in other member states. So these crises are linked with each other. Um, and I think that we've seen these different chapters of the perma crisis and we will see also additional ones to the one which we are now going through. Mm -hmm. um, and we're all looking obviously um, uh, to the French elections and wondering what the outcome will be there. And I'm knocking on wood, but if it would have a negative outcome, we would have a combination of an external fundamental crisis combined um, with an internal leadership crisis. Mm -hmm. um, probably the worst case scenario one could think of. Um, but going back to what Natalie said, if you look at these different crises, we always have reacted up to the moment where we were thinking that we were able to manage the crisis. Mm -hmm. Now, compared to other crises, we have been faster, more decisive, more united. Um, Euro crisis, it took us even two years to get to the we will do whatever it takes moment. Mm -hmm. Now we have been much faster. The question is whether we will learn the lesson from previous crises, which was also that we went as far as we had to go in order to stop the worst of happening. And often we should have gone further. In the Euro crisis, with respect to the mig migration management crisis, we should have done more. But we stopped, and the question is, will we have the stamina, will we have the political will in this crisis, mm -hmm. which is a watershed moment, which 
has entered us into a new age. And will we have the political will, the stamina as 27 member states to go further than we have done in previous crises? Mm -hmm. That means we have a lot of homework to do in the short term. We need to exert pressure on Russia. We need to support Ukraine. But we all have all also have this long-term homework to do with respect to helping to recover and to rebuild Ukraine. We have to rethink enlargement, which Natalie mentioned. Um, we have to think of strategic autonomy in a different way in terms of our levels of ambition, mm -hmm. of creating the right capabilities, but also developing a strategic culture. And I could go on with respect to the list of things we will have to do in the long term. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether we will have the political will and stamina to do the things which we will have to be doing. And the last point, I still feel among some people, despite that we feel living, have gone through the Zeitenwende, to quote the German Chancellor, we're living in this new age, that there are still some people who think that there's some way to get to a status quo ante. It won't be the same as it was before the crisis, but there is some way to get to a situation which will be similar to what it was. And these people have not understood how fundamentally the world has changed. Mm -hmm. I agree with both of you that the European Union has shown unity to this um, Ukraine crisis and uh, the EU member states have, um, shown, have thrown several long-standing policies overboard uh, and have taken steps that under normal circumstances uh, would have met with strong oppositions with each other. Uh, but now, how is the situation is likely to develop on the ground from now on and how the member states of EU are going to react? Are we going to expect that this additional um, sanctions to, to, to Russia? Are we going to expect any delivery of more weapons uh, to Ukraine, Natalie? Um, well, I think the answer to both those questions is definitely yes. Uh, and I think, you know, this, this connects also to the previous panel, which was very interesting. And, and it, you know, it, it reflects, I think, you know, at times, um, again, you know, going back to the need to really make, uh, um, you know, really understand that the paradigm has, has shifted. You know, often my impression is when we have this discussion about, you know, uh, the cost of economic sanctions, you know, can we really afford uh, to go for an embargo? And, and, and the answer to that question is, you know, by definition, relative to what? You know, you can afford something relative to what? Now, if the point of comparison is, well, the cost of sanctions, and therefore more sanctions, mm -hmm. compared to the wonderful world ex ante, huh? mm -hmm. um, well, of course you can't afford them. But if the cost of those sanctions is compared to the cost of a war that doesn't stop, then <laughs> the argument changes completely. I mean, you know, if we accept the premise, which I think we have to accept, uh, mm -hmm. otherwise there would be no point even having a sanctions discussion that sanctions are there in order to stop a war. I mean, that is the instrument that we're deploying alongside the delivery of weapons to support Ukrainian defense to stop a war. Well, the economic, let alone the human, but the economic cost of a war is far greater than the economic cost of sanctions. So I think that is the, 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 the term of, of, of the comparison that needs to be made. And I think that as Europeans, we will get there. Um, what I worry about is the fact, and, and I think we will get there in a matter of days or weeks, not in a matter of months. Mm. But I think what is almost tragic, it, it goes back to the speed problem. You know, we were very fast to begin with, far faster than in any previous crises. You know, it took two years with the Eurozone crisis. It took, what, six months with the pandemic. It took two weeks uh, with, uh, with this war. But now the momentum is slowing and the massacres are increasing. And so my fear is that we will end up doing the right thing, but having lost, you know, the moral high ground mm -hmm. uh, by waiting. I think that, just to add to what yeah. um, uh, Natalie was saying, and you were asking us um, in which direction will the things develop on the ground in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And nobody of us has a crystal ball. We mm -hmm. cannot prejudge now, at this present point in time, how the situation will develop militarily. Um, what the Ukrainian army and the Ukrainian people have achieved thus far is amazing. But we don't know how this will end militarily. We do not know what the internal developments will be in Moscow, how things will might potentially might change or develop within Russia itself. We don't also know how the Chinese will position themselves. Mm -hmm. So we have all these unknowns, all these uncertainties. And, and I believe that, unfortunately, they will remain with us. 
So even if they will, would be in agreement uh, between the Ukrainian government and the Russian on some kind of a ceasefire, it would, I think it will most probably um, not solve the issue. The issue will still remain with us. Here I must say that I'm a bit pessimistic. Um, so again, we will have to think of how we deal with the situation in the long term. And here also the energy sanctions come into play. So this argument which is being used also in my home country, uh, in my mother country, Germany, uh, mm -hmm. to say that sanctions need to hit the Russian leadership more than they hit us. I think this is a flawed argument. And uh, what, what you were saying, Natalie, we need to look at what are the costs of not imposing more pressure on Moscow. And the costs might be in terms of the future of, the, of our liberal democracy, the future also of our political system, uh, how we operate, might be at stake plus the security concerns. Um, so these costs, if things go wrong, are enormous. Um, so even if we would now, if the German government would eventually decide to impose energy uh, sanctions, it would be the right thing to do, even if it would cost money. Uh, but playing for time, which my German government is now doing effectively, I think is the wrong way of doing it. If you look at it from a longer time perspective, and I think we have a longer time perspective in front of us to deal with this crisis. Mm -hmm. Since he mentioned Germany, how do you think the role of Germany is uh, um, regarding to Russia? Because Germany and Russia had uh, close economic ties uh, um, in the past. I mean, I think, you know, and, and, and Yanis is, is better placed than myself to answer this question. Um, you know, I, I think that it goes beyond economics. I mean, obviously, there are the economic ties, there are the energy ties, but underpinning that interdependence was really um, a, an entire mindset, which kind of dates back, not even since, you know, in the post-Cold War era, I mean, it dates back to Ostpolitik, you know. And so, in a sense, kind of coming to the recognition that that has failed, I understand is a big trauma, <laughs> you know. This is something that an entire class of, of kind of political leadership has invested in and genuinely believed in. So I, I don't want to belittle it and simply reduce it to e economic interests, because I think that is simply, in a sense, the tip of the iceberg of, of, mm -hmm. of something much, much bigger um, that has informed German foreign policy for decades. Do you agree? Yes, I think that what we're seeing is actually that this is, from a German perspective, a watershed moment. It is a Zeitenwende. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that um, uh, three days after the invasion of Russia, um, that the German Chancellor made this speech and also took decision uh, also on his own with a very small circle of people, showed a lot of leadership. Mm. But we're seeing since then how much Germany is struggling with that. Yeah. Um, because it is a mindset which you need to change. It is the strategic culture of what you need to change in Germany. And this is a long-term process. And you can already see that deep forces which are still living in, a, in the old mindset uh, have understood that it's, it cannot be con continued, but they're still, still trying to save as much of it as possible. Yeah. Um, and that is something which will also not only be a burden on the country, especially when the costs, the consequences of the sanctions, the economic consequences, um, also the consequences for ordinary people in their ordinary lives, in their daily lives, when they are being felt, Germany and the German leadership will get even under more, more pressure. Um, so there's resistance to preparing and to implementing what Zeitenwende actually means. Mm -hmm. um, and that is something which, seen also from the EU perspective, from other EU member states' perspective, is very important to watch and to support the process of Germany getting to realize what role it needs to play in this new era. Because, you know, I mean, I think that, I mean, and I think, you know, Germany epitomizes this, but I think it's obviously part of a much, much broader European story. You know, we've moved from, uh, if you like, an age of idealism that kind of went uh, up until, I would say, you know, 1990s up until 2008, a global mm -hmm. financial crisis, which actually then coincided with war in Georgia. Um, to an age of what I would define as pragmatism, with pragmatism cutting both ways. I mean, you know, both recognizing that, hey, you know, um, mm -hmm. and therefore sanctions on Russia on the one hand, but also pragmatism in the sense that we need to keep on engaging, reaching out, yeah. and so we had a sort of double track approach. And now we've come to the realization that we're in the third age, and it's really an age of war. 
Right. Um, and by age of war, I don't just, quote unquote, mean war in Ukraine, but the shift of a paradigm from a post-war era, meaning a post-Second World War era, to a pre-war era. And that is something that is, you know, right. a German story, but it's a, a European story. And, in this, and in, this, in this era of war, I think there are two things which we have to have in mind. It's the end of innocence and the end of naivety. Church, because we yeah. have been very naive over the past years or decades. Right. Let us hope the next day of Europe will be a better future for, for Europe and for global order. Thank you very much, Ms. Tots and Mr. Emanuelidis, for joining Thank us in, today in this Delphi Economic Forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.